Zion Hezekiah here, your guy Hez, joined here by Melissa Amore. Hello. Hey, hey, hey. We got Adrian Kwan, aka DJI Can Pro. What's good, Zion? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And our very special guest, Mr. Ro P from NBA TV. Damn that rhymes. <laughs> What's going on, Ro? What's popping? What's popping? Wakanda forever. Wakanda That's it. forever. You know it, man. You know it. Absolutely. Yeah. Wakanda forever, for yeah. sure, for sure. So, all right, guys. So, going back to Wednesday, August the 26th, it was a very historical day in sports. Uh, well, just the day prior, actually, for a little bit of context, I believe it was the Toronto Raptors. Uh, they had a team meeting, and uh, they discussed, you know, boycotting the playoff game scheduled for the next day, or, or a couple of days later, I believe, the 27th against the Celtics. So, back to the 26th now of August, uh, the Milwaukee Bucks were actually the first team uh, to, in fact, boycott a playoff game. Um, and then subsequently, the other two playoff games on the schedule were postponed. Uh, we had games boycotted, of course, in the WNBA, Major League Baseball, other sports leagues followed suit. A uh, big thing, once again, very, very historical time and moment in sports. And this was, of course, all centered around issues of systemic racism and police brutality. Uh, with the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, as the latest incident to occur. Here's what we want to discuss today, once again, mostly within the context of sports. Uh, when we first heard about the boycotts, and for me, I don't even like necessarily calling it a boycott. I mean, technically, it was more of a strike or a protest. I mean, that's kind of the term that's being used in the media is a boycott, but more, it was more of a strike or a protest. But when we first heard about, you know, if you want to call it a boycott, um, I guess the question I want to kind of throw to the panel first is, what was your initial reaction? And then, you know, with sports leagues now resuming, you know, we can probably discuss this after, how optimistic are you that those actions that were taken, you know, by athletes and, and sports leagues will eventually, um, you know, lead to meaningful, um, you know, change, that there'll be meaningful, I guess you can say, pieces of the puzzle uh, that will actually lead to some kind of significant change in society. Um, but first things first, I'm just kind of curious, once again, just throwing it out to the panel, what was your initial reaction dating back to August 26, when once again, the Milwaukee Bucks were the first team to kind of shut it down and say, we're not playing a very historical moment in sports role. Let's throw it to you first, brother. My first reaction was, this is awesome. And you talked about the Toronto Raptors. The Raptors have been in conversation with the Boston Celtics and they were mm. you know, engaging in open dialogue saying, okay, this is really what we're seriously planning to do. Whether you talk about Jalen Brown, who's been on the front lines protesting in his hometown right here of Atlanta, Fred Van Vliet, who's been very vocal. They oh, yeah. generally came together as two competing opponents and saying, obviously there are, are items right now that are bigger than basketball. So that is commendable. Then you have George Hill, Sterling Brown, who was obviously a victim of police brutality early on in his career with the Milwaukee Bucks. George Hill witnesses what happens and he says, you know what? I don't feel like we should play today. So he didn't put any pressure on, the, on his teammates, but he says, hey, I'm not playing today. He tells his teammates, Giannis spoke about this yesterday in the post-game news conference. He didn't put any pressure on us, but we wanted to stand by him, and we united, and we all decided not to play. So you can say what you want. There's some players who said, well, maybe they should have, you know, said something to the other teams, but this was something that wasn't planned. It wasn't premeditated. It was spur of the moment, and it happened. So, um, but as far as moving forward, the players gave the governors of teams or the owners, they gave them specific targets so those owners can deploy their resources, their assets and influence to make change. And that's what we saw with the document that came out with the NBA Players Association and the NBA players agreeing and the NBA league agreeing to, okay, these are the, the itemized things that we are going to push moving forward. Right, and we'll definitely touch on that more in a second. Uh, thanks so much for sharing, Ro. Uh, Melissa, to you, what was your initial reaction when that all uh, went down on uh, the 26th of August? I think it was a good thing. You know, everybody's showing that, you know, they're kind of fed up with what's happening in the world today. And I know, like, in the beginning, they actually took a stance before the, you know, when the NBA actually resumed, everybody was putting their, you know, not their name on the back of their logo, but putting words or phrases, 
you know, just to stand up to show people, you know what, black lives do matter. Some of the back of the, some of the back of the jerseys, you know, equality, different things like that, you know, and it's just having them just say, you know what, for this, for today, we are not going to play. That really took a stance. And I really hope that it was like really heard across the board, you know, like, I just don't want it to fall on deaf ears for everything that they have been doing because the media has always said, you know, well, these guys only play basketball, you know, shut up and dribble was one of the comments that one of the reporters had made, you know, and it's more than that, you know, it's our livelihood. It could be one of the NBA players. It could be one of our own, you know, on our own children, you know, that this happens to. So it's good that they voice their opinion, you know, to everybody and to let them know, you know what, we are not going to stand up for this. Enough is enough. And we have to join in unity. But the only thing I must say, though, that I was kind of wary about was when LeBron said, you know what, he wants to cancel the rest of the NBA season. That to me was just like, LeBron, okay. but yes, yes, he was, right. one of the that was, you know, I believe the Clippers were involved as well in terms of, um, you know, let's just kind of shut it down. Um, obviously, there was a lot of emotions involved, but um, yeah, a lot of stuff did come out there. Exactly. But with that, it's just, you know, cutting off the NBA season after you guys just started back, I thought that it shouldn't have happened. You know, like, don't just cut off the NBA season. Everybody came back and actually worked really hard. I understand, like, we have to come back and, you know, take a stance at this point. But I felt that LeBron taking that step, he didn't discuss it with anybody. And I felt that he probably felt everybody else was going to jump on board. But that really, at the end of the day, wasn't the case. It was just him, his team, and I guess the LA Clippers that were on board saying, you know what, we're not going to resume the rest of the NBA season. And everybody else was kind of still in talks like, you know what, we should play at the end of the day. You know, we understand that this problem is not going to solve, be solved just by us boycotting. But at the end of the day, we still resume to show everybody that we are taking a stance regardless. We are going to play for the players. We're going to play for Jacob Blake. We're going to play for, you know, everybody that has passed on. And then after that, kind of tackle the inequality within the NBA itself and then take it abroad is what I kind of believe things should be, I guess the direction things should be going. Hey, Melissa, just to chime in on something, mm -hmm. as, as far as the players actually wanting to boycott and, and, and protest and end the season, you can look at it and say, yep, yeah, they did put a lot of work into it and ultimately they are back playing. But you have to say on the other side, these players – were willing to sacrifice their paychecks and and millions upon millions, potentially billions of dollars for the league just to get their point across. And that threat alone, that just showed me, okay, these guys are serious. This is clearly, you can talk about any other sport, but the NBA, along with the WNBA, they're, they're the strongest unified leagues in the world. You can compare it to, to, to Major League Baseball or the NFL, but the NBA, whether it be the Players Association and the actual league are always on the same page. They're working together, trying to find solutions. But would that have, uh, Ro, would that have been fair to ask for, let's say, younger players who are on rookie contracts or guys who are on, you know, one year or expiring contracts to make that kind of sacrifice? I could definitely see it for established players like, you know, the Chris Pauls and LeBron James uh, of the NBA. But for me, that might have been a lot to ask, uh, you know, once again, some of the younger players that haven't, you know, stacked up, you know, the dose, so to speak, uh, throughout their careers, right? No, no, you, you're absolutely right. And, and just like in the world, there's different levels to pay grades. And we know that's uh, definitely apparent in the NBA, the way things are set up. Not everybody is making the top notch max salaries like your Steph Curry's or your James Harden's, LeBron, et cetera. So that would have been a tough ask. But at the same time, I think that points to how serious these players are about really pushing for social change amplifying that message, but also having those specific tangible items and attainable goals. I think that's how serious they were about it. For sure. Thanks so much. So AK, let's get you in on this discussion. And just for context, we've discussed this here on the show. I'll just kind of bring it up again. Um, so going back to, you know, Colin Kaepernick, where years ago, he's the one that really kind of kicked things off in the world of sports, you know, taking a knee, refusing to stand for the anthem. Um, DJ ICAM Pro, Adrian Kwan, uh, you actually, as a football fan, a big football fan, uh, you decided to boycott the NFL for, I mean, I can't remember now, you can share it with us, two or three years, um, you know, due to that whole situation where you just completely stopped watching uh, football. 
Um, so if you want to talk a little bit about that, you can, but specifically, AK, what were your initial thoughts? What was your reaction uh, to the initial uh, po uh, protest uh, once again um, with the NBA players uh, on August the 26th, man? Yeah, so you and I have, ha have had this conversation on and off camera. Um, so you know my stance is that the only thing that matters in this world is money, right? Obviously, the racism, everything, that, that's – that's a byproduct of the money and the power. So if you want to have change, you want to have real change, you got to hit them where the money is. You just follow the money. Um, I did boycott the NFL because, um, yeah, like, I just thought that the owners of the NFL were treating Colin Kaepernick unfairly, that they were being racist. Their policies and their protocol with him kneeling and just their whole narrative about it, trying to make him a villain. So I just couldn't support it anymore. I used to watch NFL every Sunday. Like, you couldn't even call my phone. Like, that's how committed I was to the NFL. And I was a Niners fan. <laughs> and on top of that, I actually didn't even want Colin Kaepernick to be our quarterback anymore because I didn't think he was that good at the time. <laughs> so that, that's just showing you how real I was with the whole situation. Um, in terms of with, with the NBA, with, with, the, with the strike or the boycott, I thought it was a long time coming. I thought they should have... I, I thought they shouldn't have played those NBA games. Was it when, when the Clippers owner, was it, what's his name, Donald Sterling? Donald, Donald Sterling back yeah. in 2014. Yeah, I thought, I thought they should have not played those playoff games just to send a message at that point. Um, and you know that even before they started this bubble, I thought the NBA shouldn't have resumed. I thought they should have just not played. Because the thing is, going back to status quo, that's just what it is. It's status quo. And, and that's why I'm saying, like, that's why this, this shooting happened, right? Um, yeah, and going back to your point, Zion, it is difficult for the rookies and the guys that are on the smaller salaries, right? Especially the guys that are coming in and, you know, they're probably fighting for the next rookie class that's coming in. So it's not easy. It's, it's real sacrifice that you have to make, and it's always a long-term game. Um, sometimes when we do these boycotts and strikes, it's great to bring awareness to the situation, but it's also almost like Band-Aid fixes. And we live in a society now where it's all about trending. You know, people get excited about something. It trends for a couple of weeks. And then, you know, Kanye West runs for president. And that's the next talking point. So, yeah, you know, for me, I, I, I actually think that they sh it was – I commended them for stopping the play. And I actually thought they should have just ended the season. I was with LeBron on that one. You right. know, I'm not the biggest LeBron fan, but I was actually like, yeah, you know what? He's taking a stance. Um, and I thought the Clippers and the Lakers, if, if the report's right, that they didn't want to continue the season, I, like I commended them for that. But I know it's a difficult decision. I mean, you know, if, if I was a rookie or I was, you know, on a 10-day contract or whatever it may be, and I'm just, you know, I'm not making – 50 million off the court with endorsements it's a difficult decision to make because you know i got you know, a lot of these guys want to sustain their lifestyle they're they're supporting their family so i get it but right. you got to hit them where the where it hurts most and that's that's the money and i follow the money you're, you're absolutely right and, and by the way i want to shout out will packer and chris paul they put out a documentary you can check it out on quibi it's called blackballed and that kind of takes you into that whole situation back in 2014 where mm -hmm. the opportunity to boycott was there or protest and they didn't necessarily do it with Donald Sterling and everything that happened with the Clippers. Talking to a lot of players on that team, there were a number of players that did want to boycott or protest during that game, but ultimately they decided not to. So that's one thing I want to get out there. Um, yeah. But the other thing, as far as not playing or continuing at the remote campus in Orlando, although it's called the bubble, Ultimately, you need a platform that's powerful to push what you're passionate about. And that's something I like to say consistently. So obviously, LeBron James has millions upon millions of, of followers, and he can say whatever he wants on social and it's going to get attention. However, people don't know who Fred Van Vliet is worldwide, for the most part, like they do a LeBron James. People don't know who George Hill is. People don't necessarily know some of these other players that are in the, in the league. And while they're in Orlando, that gives them this opportunity to have this platform, to have all the media outlets there, to have all eyes on them. So 
with them playing basketball, people are obviously are going to watch because they want to watch the game, but you still bring attention to the issues at hand and you have a chance to amplify them all so everybody around the world can hear what you're trying to push. Absolutely. So guys, NBA players, you know, they've demanded more involvement, more action, you know, from the league, from the owners, you know, regarding the social injustice issues. Um, so going back to what I kind of touched on earlier, we'll kind of um, steer the discussion in this uh, uh, direction. How optimistic are you that these, you know, protests that, you know, boycotting of the games, um, you know, the strike, whatever you want to call it, that these protests will eventually yield some tangible results. And I'll kick it to you first, Ro. Obviously, you're in America, you're in the United States of America, you know, very close to the situation, and obviously your involvement working with the NBA. Um, how optimistic are you that, um, you know, we are on the right track, in, in the right direction uh, to eventually getting to some kind of, as I said, substantial change uh, regarding these social uh, injustice issues? I think that the players have really put it all on ownership. And if they don't really follow up on these items that they've laid out, I think that we could see another potential protest and this time it could probably be bigger, but I, I, I personally don't feel as feel like it's going to get to that just because of all the things that have happened so far. And also, like AK mentioned, it's all about the money. And, and if you don't have another season, I think ownership and the league knows and the players know as well that will cost billions because let's say this, let's say they cancel the season. So the, the owners then would be able to rip up the collective bargaining agreement. So there's all types of different financial ramifications. Then you start affecting the salary cap and, and the season, that yep. players can. Yes. So, so for the most part, the players want to play. We know that that's why they train. That's why they, they, they want to play at the end of the day. And the league wants to have a product for fans to be able to consume for the networks to be able to broadcast again, like AK said, you got to follow the money. So I don't think that, the owners want to have another potential protest or work stoppage because they want to make sure that they're still generating income. The NBA has lost so much money this year. When you go back to everything that happened in China at the beginning of the year, that was a, there was a trickle down effect. Then you have the pandemic hit. So right now, I don't know if you guys know this, but it's costing the NBA over 150 million to operate the remote campus. That's just under, you know, a, a 180,000 uh, uh 100 180,000 yes per day so that's a lot of money that's already been spent and they've already taken a a, a huge loss this season on revenue but mm -hmm. the initiatives that are put forward especially with all the attention that it's gained from gotten from the media i definitely think that we're going to have a lot of positive things happening from these uh individual initiatives okay thank you very much for sharing melly mel <clears throat> yes yes so for me, I think like regarding the, the whole boycott, um, the protests are, are, are fine. I just don't want it to get lost in translation. I mean, we've been protesting since May, you know, for George Floyd. And now that we have Jacob Blake, <clears throat> that's another one. And I just feel like us taking the stance, it's the, like, like AK said, you know, it's, there for a moment. It's, it's trendy at the time, and then it slowly dies down. So if the NBA was really to boycott and shut down the NBA, it's trending for maybe a week or two, maybe three, but then it slowly dies down because something else is just going to take over it. So then at the end of the day, is it, was it really worth it to shut it down? You know what I mean? In terms of, even the, like you said, with the rookie players trying to establish themselves into the game. They need money. They're not as established as LeBron. You know, so what that have been worth it in that sense to shut everything down is just my question but you know for me i stand with the protesters you know our voices need to be heard and i think right now america needs change from within the top from the white house you know come november i'm really hoping that we get significant change because if that doesn't happen i don't know what the next four years is going to be like in the u.s you know like yeah. right now there's a lot of racial tension and you know it's getting from bad to worse no, and, and I agree with you. And one of the initiatives is the leagues taking their facilities, whether they be practice facilities or NBA arenas, and converting those areas into safe 
in-person voting options for people because right. you know about voter suppression, that's a real thing. Yeah. So for the NBA to take that on and have a Staples Center or to have an American Airlines Center open and available, people will be able to come there and not have to worry as much about, you know, COVID ramifications. So that's an awesome thing that the NBA is doing. The, the voting, that's, that's huge. And I like how LeBron took the stance, sorry, to, you know, get the poll workers, you know, right. at some of the stations, right? right. To help right. aid, right. to watch over, to make sure, you know, there's no wow. voter suppression. And, and, and that's awesome. And he has, he has his own initiative that he's been pushing, but bigger than national, I really, and, and I talked to one of my, I'm not going to name drop, but one of my guys I work with that's a Hall of Famer, he says these players need to focus if they really want to make change. National is one thing, but they got to connect with their local organizers. So whether they're in Toronto or they're in Milwaukee or they're in Orlando or, you know, you can name in any NBA city, there are already people on the ground that are pushing these certain things with their local law enforcement or local government. Get with those people, handle your own backyard first. And then you do this here, you do this here. So one at a time. So then you take care of your individual cities and then you can vote for the national and then you can begin to, begin to make change in that way. But st first take care of your own backyard. Grassroots. But, but back to voting, uh, Ro, and I'll get AK to chime in on this as well. Uh, what about the report that uh, recently came out that apparently only 20% of the NBA players uh, within the bubble, or maybe perhaps even NBA players at large, are actually uh, at this point, or when it was reported a few days ago, uh, registered to vote. I mean, if you're going to talk the talk, are you walking the walk? If 80% of the players apparently are not even uh, registered to vote, um, is that not an issue? AK, you chiming in on that one? Because I'm not, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of that information. I didn't see that report, so I don't. Okay. I, I don't want to. That, that was uh, reported. Uh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure. But as far as you saying talk the talk and walk the walk, I think that is important. And if you're not registered to vote, it it takes longer to put a post up on social media if you're going to type out a long paragraph or post a picture with hashtags. It takes longer to do that than it does to register to vote. Right. So there's really no excuse and unless you're a convicted felon and no longer have the, the, the right to vote. If you're an American citizen, you have the right to vote, period. And you Apparently, can Apparently, uh, Chris Paul, he sat down all his teammates and right there on the spot, he got them all in one shot uh, registered to vote. So all of the members uh, of the OKC Thunder. But uh, yeah, that was reported that uh, the majority, overwhelming majority, uh, of the players um, weren't registered to vote. Obviously, there's still time, but uh, that... shout outs to Chris Paul for doing that. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. That's that's leadership, right? Oh, uh, that is leadership, and there, there's a reason why he's the president of the Players Association, and he's one of the best leaders. Charles Barkley calls him the best leader in our game. There's, it's not a secret that he's you know been a leader off the court as well as on the court. And uh, I know AK is not the biggest Chris Paul fan, nor is he the biggest LeBron James <laughs> fan. <laughs> we'll, no, well, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> listen, listen, that's when, when I say I'm not a fan of certain players in the NBA, it's, it's from a basketball standpoint. Of course, right? of course. It's not the, the, it's not the person. Hey, um, hey, AK, before you go, I'm just going to say you're not going to get an invite for the banana boat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, you know what? When I was, listen, when I was uh, living in Atlanta, I was working in a music studio, and let's just say um, a colleague of mine in there actually went to high school with Chris Paul. So I, I had some inside information in terms Ooh, of his leadership shit. style as well. So, but um, to to get to to Zion's point about the twenty percent, only twenty percent of uh, NBA players are registered voters. Um, I'm not surprised because I think voting is not a big thing in the young community, and for the most part, the NBA is a young a young person's league. I think what that shows is that especially even with just what happened in terms of how the NBA went on their strike and their boycott, there seemed to be a lot of confusion even within the players in terms of the Orlando Magic thought they were playing, the Milwaukee Bucks decided not to play, the communication wasn't there. And I think this is also a sign that maybe it's time that the NBA players collectively meet more and discuss these issues at hand as a group 
where everybody is actually educated. Like we have leaders in the league. Like if you're if seeing Chris Paul and LeBron and whoever's leading these meetings that they're educating everybody, they're having open conversation, they're getting p- different points of view. Um, so I think that's important. Um, to get back to the initial question of, do I think there's going to be actual change? I think there I'll will be- to call you in the big picture of things. Yeah, I think um, there will be some change. Uh, obviously there's a lot of pressure right now. There's the, you know, the, the spotlight is on the NBA and the NBA owners and what they're going to do. But I think in terms of long-term, you have to know what you're asking for. You got to be asking for the right things. I was listening to Andrew Schultz's podcast the other day and he was talking about something. He was talking about how the reason why the NBA players should play is because, you know, they got to get the money, you know, you're going to get your money and then they should start their own black lobbyist groups. And I've been talking about that too, in terms of that's really how things get done in Washington is, is the lobbyist groups and who has more power than these NBA owners. So if you're the NBA players, and you're dealing with your owners now, what are you asking for? Because they, they're the ones with all the money. I think I sent you the text about how much uh, Steve Ballmer is worth compared to how much Kawhi Leonard is worth, right? Mm-hmm. Like Kawhi Leonard, as much money as he has, he doesn't have the power and the money as the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers, right? So if you're asking for things to get done, well, he, those owners now have to start dealing with those lobbyist groups to lobby for the policy changes and, and things that have to be get done in Washington, right? Like, like we talk about, you may not be able to change a man's heart. A racist is a racist. Like we, we talked about how um, they had the FBI or CIA report how the, the white supremacists have been infiltrating police departments and the FBI and all that for how long? Since 2006, right? So that's always going to happen. You're always going to have people that hate. You're always going to have racists what you have to do now is hold those people accountable immediately, right? This, this is one of the biggest problems is like these things continue to happen and there's no accountability. Like even the, the young kid that shot two of the protesters in, it was in Kenosha and he had the rifle and he walked by police officers. They didn't even look at him. Like, what is that? Right? So people aren't being held accountable. Yes. That's, that's, that's total BS. Right? right? You know what I'm saying? So those are the changes that have to be made. Like we, the, the people have to start understanding that like you have to start lobbying for those policy changes, those, those legislation, legislation changes. And it has to get done. Like there ha- action has to be taken. I always say this is 2020. We live in a social media world. Everybody is aware. You're either aware or you don't care. So this idea of, We want to continue to have people be aware. I don't, I get it. There's some people that may be living under a rock, but for the most part, people are aware. So Mm -hmm. you're either aware or you don't care. And again, it's, it's about trending. People love, it's just a trending topic, but action has to be taken. And and that that, that individual that you spoke about, I believe his name is, is Kyle Rittenhouse. And Mm -hmm. I saw some things on him. He, he was he was illegally armed, number one. He was mm-hmm. out after the, the city imposed curfew. He was caught on video by the police, obviously. He shot three people, killed two people, and obviously left the scene. We all witnessed that. And he was peacefully arrested. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jacob Blake is, is fighting for his life right now, and, and he's paralyzed. And they had him handcuffed to his bedside. That's, I, I, that I didn't understand. <laughs> yeah, it's like, so, I mean, come on. And, and the thing that gets me, we have all the evidence. It's on video. We've seen these things happen over and over and over again, and it's still not enough. It's like, what else do you need? You can see it right in front of your face. What else do you need? Um, and that's, that's just been very disappointing. For sure. So, but the, the police chief also came and he was, they were asking him yesterday, you know, like, oh, did you see the video, um, you know, of the incident that happened? And he clearly lied to the reporters and said no. And if you look on social media, you would see that two days prior, he was outside, you know, with a group of uh, protesters and he was actually watching the video on a cell phone. Oh boy. And he stood there saying, oh, no, we need more evidence. You know, apparently he had a knife and he was going back to his car for the knife or or, or something, had a knife in his hand. And I'm like, 
I'm looking at the video and he had no knife in his hand. He was just clearly walking back to the car and he was pulled on by his shirt and then literally at close range shot seven times in the back. But yet Kyle gets to walk around the street in a, with a rifle, you know, past, he, he had his hands up, he thought he was gonna get arrested and the cops did nothing. So he ended up leaving the state, going back home to sleep, <laughs> okay, to wake up the next day and then, you know, he gets arrested. And that's, and that's why I, that's why I say there's like there's just other powers at hand in terms of how America is right now, right? Right? It's like we all see it. Everybody sees it, but there's something else going on, and it's it's the money and the power, and it's the people that are in control that that's dictating this narrative, that's dictating these actions. So unless you can get those powers at hand to change that narrative and change the actions that are being taken, I don't think anything's going to change. And, and the big part is, and, and I'll bring it back to voting, and it's not just about, again, on the national level, you need to figure out, and I believe it's uh, vote411.com. Don't quote me on that, but I, I'll do some research. And I, I've been sent that, that website, and it allows mm -hmm. you to go in whatever region you're in and do research on candidates, um, because, when you look at the way America's set up, there are actually laws that were made for certain people not to be able to vote. When you look at minorities, when you look at women, they were not, at one time, they were viewed as individuals that were not valuable commodities, you know, when it came to making decisions for lawmakers. You know, therefore, laws were made to enforce them, preventing them from actually voting. You know, that's, and that's to me just looking at that now, that's crazy, but these laws are actually in place. So for the people that are in charge that made those laws, they specifically didn't want this group of people to vote. So those things obviously need to be changed. How are those things gonna be changed? Putting the right people in office that can lobby or can filibuster or whatever political term you wanna use to get the change in motion for these things to happen. Sure. Sure. So guys, let's leave it there for now. Uh, great discussion. Um, there's so much more that we could, uh, you know, get into and surely we'll continue, you know, having these discussions um, as we move forward. And, um, you know, I'll just say this for myself. I mean, the question that I asked as far as, you know, how optimistic are we that, you know, things are going to substantially change or things are going to eventually lead to, um, you know, significant change. I won't get too deep into it, but personally for myself, I'm not very optimistic uh, at all when I see, you know, the state of the world and just how things are unfolding. And uh, once again, not to get too deep into things, but you guys know me as a, as a Christian man, uh, as a believer uh, in God. Um, you know, from a spiritual standpoint, I do believe that, you know, these things are eventually going to get even worse than we see right now before they get better. Um, but I do appreciate, you know, the players, um, you know, at least making an attempt to, to do something. And who knows, it could lead to small little incremental uh, changes. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, and even to what you said earlier, uh, Melissa, in terms of, you know, change uh, from the top, um, you know, not to get too political, but I definitely don't believe that, um, you know, Joe Biden is, is, is the answer to, to solving uh, America's problems. But uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. <laughs> we can get it into is a change, uh, though. <laughs> I, I, I'll say this. He, he, might, he might not be the, the prototypical or the right solution. Right. However, you, sometimes you have to look at the lesser of the two evils. Uh, and, I hear that. And, yep. and, and you have to, you know, make the best selection possible. I hear that. Listen, but this is all I'll say. From a Canadian perspective, I mean, we look, you guys are our brothers and sisters uh, down south. Our, our prayers are with y'all. I mean, not even just the stuff we're talking about now with um, systemic racism and, and police brutality. I mean, y'all have been hit really hard with the, you know, the virus, coronavirus um, in, in, in key states like Florida and New York and, and what have you. Um, so our, our, our prayers are with y'all, man. We're, we're with you. You're, you're our brothers and sisters. And uh, yeah. definitely wish you all the best. And, uh, you know, we're here to support you uh, in any way we can. And, um, yeah, thanks for the discussion, guys. Everyone, thanks for chiming we in. It. And, uh, and, let's uh, continue and, to keep the discussion uh, flowing and, uh, you know, hopefully wish for better better days ahead. And, and, and I'll say this before we go. I, I appreciate the support and a lot of the issues that we're suffering from right now when it comes to COVID-19 or due to poor leadership 
at, at the high in the highest office. There's a lot of things that could have been that's right. to prevent everything that's happening. However, there is leadership or uh, alleged leadership in, in the highest office that clearly is incompetent in, in certain areas. And, and personally, Ro, once again, I want to thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, back to the topic of leadership. I uh, certainly do appreciate your leadership using your platform, your media platform. Uh, we watch you closely. We appreciate everything that you do. And I uh, just want to uh, continue to uh, commend you and uh, continue to fight the fight, continue to lead those meaningful discussions. And uh, once again, all the best to our American brothers and sisters. No, nah, I definitely appreciate that. Thank you all for having me. This has been um, this has been awesome to have this you know open conversation. So um, it's all about our future. I, I know you say you don't think necessarily change is going to happen. All I'll say is this: it number one, it, it costs the same thing to be positive as it does to be negative. So I'm going to be optimistic. And we know change change doesn't take place overnight. But as long as you can make small change just increment by increment hopefully we can move forward and eventually have great change for our next generation like my little baby girl so Love i want it i want it to be better for her next generation jordan daddy right. thank you so much for sharing that on that note thank you so much ro ak and mel for chiming in i'm zion hezekiah you're tuned into toronto talk sports and more Thank you for watching. Please click the like button and leave us a comment with your feedback. And don't forget to subscribe with notifications to see more engaging and interactive content. Toronto Talk Sports and more for the love of the six. Let's connect.